the problem was that they couldn't give them money. And so that project just died on the vine. Um, and now what we're uh, seeing is that projects where, like copper, that may be produced in Ecuador with Solaris on their project where they had a potential investment by Zijin, even though that copper is not coming to Canada, you know, uh, they're TSX listed, but, you know, they basically stopped that. And that would have been very good for the company. Special coverage from the Gould Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida, is brought to you by Contango Ore developing Alaska's next gold mines. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the EdJR Mining Guy on Twitter, and of course, your host for this conversation. It's the last one here at the Rural Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida, and we saved the best for last. We saved Joe Mazumdar of Exploration Insights. Is somebody coming after me? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were really looking forward to this conversation, Joe. I just mentioned we haven't talked in a long time, actually. So it's time to catch up. All right. Lots yeah, to no, catch no. up. Looking and, forward uh, to it. We're same here. Like, South Florida. Exactly. Yeah. Instead of Vancouver, you know, make it's, it make it more complicated for everybody. They're both hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, Joe, I appreciate the, uh, you taking the time. Thanks so much for sitting down no with worries. us. No. Um, let's start with sentiment. It's always yep. a good, good starting point. Like, what sentiment in the exploration and junior uh, junior mining space right now? Uh, it, it's not it's uh, it's not positive, uh, uh, as, and and you know that's all linked to uh, you know people. I uh, the summer as well. We're hitting in the summer doldrums probably a bit, uh, but I mean in terms of exploration, actually funding it is not positive. So most of the people I've seen trying to go to the markets, they've been issuing warrants, a lot of full warrants, a lot of you know long dated warrants, a lot of low premium warrants, uh, even in, you know, whatever decent jurisdictions. Uh, there's few companies that can actually raise at just, you know, their, their previous price and leave money out there to actually uh, uh, that the share price goes up after. Uh, and I've had that experience with with a Peruvian copper explorer, that's worked out well. I've seen a, actually a Yukon copper explorer as well raise 10 million bucks uh, at decent levels. So uh, yeah, there are some that are happening, uh, but it's it's not flooding the market. It's not a lot. Well, I've looked at the numbers. At last I did the summary numbers was actually mid-May, so I haven't looked lately. But we were way behind. Yeah. Like in, in mid-May, I know it's ticked up a little bit. But not much. Yeah. Keep going on. It doesn't feel like it. Like yeah. And, and, and if we see more M&A, then, you know, the sentiment will rise. You know, but the problem is right now, people are, the M&A is right now not quite, it's getting to the development stage, but a lot more of it is in production. People don't want the permitting. People don't want the capital. Yeah. But eventually, you know, they might get there. I'm, I'm a PR guy, but I'm running out of arguments. Quite honestly, yeah. right? Like a positive arguments. Like why is gold? Like we're at twenty four hundred dollar gold, yeah. and the exploration and the juniors are not moving at all. Yeah, I'm running out of arguments. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and and where do you get leverage? You know, and part of my presentation was talking about where leverage is, and the leverage is definitely not in exploration. We need the positive environment uh, to lower their cost of capital and give them access to financing, but. Uh, you know, uh, for them to go up is really drill catalysts. You know, and do they hit a hole or not? Yeah, and we, we do see that. Like, we do see some of those exploration stories yep. develop nicely, like yep. especially when they hit. Yep. Uh, but on the contrary, we're seeing probably 50% reduction in drilling this year. Yeah, because there's no money. And, 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 and when they had to start, there was no financing happening. Yeah. And so people are financing in the middle of the summer, trying to expand their programs. Yeah. You know, any little tick in sentiment, they'll, you know, you know they'll, they'll hit. Yeah. Uh, what sector is working right now? Let's, let's start there. Like, what, what are you looking at? Like, if you look gold, silver, copper, if you were going to look at that, is there, is there anyone that stands out particularly? Because you, you well, just I mean, it's, mentioned it's, two that are all over the place. Uh, it, like with companies, I mean, one of my top picks is Origin. And, you know, that's not a financing problem because they have a cash flowing royalty with Irma Tanyo. Uh, you know, they have no cost creep with that, obviously. They maintain their GNA stable. They have an alliance with Altius that basically mitigates any costs in terms of um, generating more royalties. And, and importantly, most of their valuation is linked up to a 1% NSR on a deposit that's being advanced by Anglo Gold uh, called Silicon so, Merlin, yeah. which went from 4 million to 13. And, you know, these guys are thinking it's going to get much bigger. And so there's an M&A underpinning in that. You know, uh, that that keeps that going. Uh, another one would be that, you know, that's done well for me recently is Bravo Mining. And that's all exploration. So this was a development story that, you know, is hitting the orphan period in terms of development. But they did a, you know, electromagnetic survey on the entire package and hit some great copper holes that are not 
nickel and not palladium and platinum. And that added 110 plus million dollars to their market cap. It was just a couple of weeks ago, I think. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and they continue to hit uh, and there's still more anomalies to test. And so that, you know, brings the retail sector in terms of the excitement of a discovery. But it's that. resource agnostic, commodity agnostic. I mean, like it yeah, doesn't matter if it's it, gold, silver, it's, it's copper. The if, result. You, if you hit... It's, it doesn't matter. It's definitely that two standard deviations of the grade and in a good jurisdiction in the car just that's got a lot of infrastructure. Another one would be like Hannon Metals. I mean, Peruvian Copper Explorer. I went on site the late last year. And what I liked about it and what I continue to like about it is how big the anomalies are, how many porphyry copper gold deposits they seem to be finding. The, the problem has been permitting timeline, but they still continue to find more to drill. Yeah. Which 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 is allowed them to raise another th uh, three million and also allowed uh, you know their their share price to go up. No, no, it's, it still seems very specific. Like it's it not is. a broad it move. Like, so. No, no, there's no this. It's not like a leverage and all boats are rising. It's very specific, and a lot of those players I'm talking about are 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 have strong shareholders, no. and so the little that is liquid is moving no. pa up, not down. So nothing's really changed the last six months. It feels like. Right. Well, There's a uh, small no, macro, financing window, but macro like, wise, probably not. But you know what's driving those moves in the companies I own are are the what internal catalysts that are funded. Exactly. Yeah. Now um, let's zoom out a little bit. Let's, let's talk more macro. Uh, let's talk about jurisdictions. And uh, I think Canada is doing its, it, itself a massive disservice these days. Like yeah. I think it seems like it's trying everything to to get off that tier one status. Like yep. it doesn't want to be a mining jurisdiction anymore. It doesn't want to be an oil and gas jurisdiction. It doesn't want to be a mining jurisdiction. Um, l let's start there. Is Canada still a tier one jurisdiction? Uh, it's going down. It's going down. But as I showed in my presentation, you know, a lot of the money raised uh, for uh, if we just stick to gold exploration uh, is being spent in low risk jurisdictions like Canada, U.S., Australia. Uh, and most of the companies operate there. Why? Because that's where they can get funded to operate. Uh, but that could change because the capital gain tax might have issue, uh, you know, might might reduce uh, the amount of flow through that they have access to. Um, you know, uh, jurisdictions like uh, British Columbia are reforming their uh, the Mineral Tenure Act, which might have implications uh, for staking uh, and, and more pre-consultation, which might slow down the process or maybe, you know, generate a veto. Uh, and also now, like getting into the Yukon with with the issues with Victoria Gold, that might have more implications on development projects, and not only in the Yukon, but potentially in any Arctic environment, um, uh, especially with the heat bleach. And so, uh, you know, I think Quebec and Ontario continue to be good jurisdictions, uh, no matter what. Uh, uh, BC right now, under the left wing government and, you know, the Supreme Court decision to have them reform the Mineral Tenure Act, um, that's going to be uh, a problem. Talk, talking about problem, the Canada's making a move to restrict M&A. Foreign companies yeah. buying M&A. I think it's very well, targeted. It, it, it is has. very targeted. I think there's one audience they really want to exclude from, from that M&A, but it's very broad worded, like phrased. Yeah, so so I, I think we all know who they're targeting, but they're not saying that. And so that leaves a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're sort of saying it. We know it, so it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's so, so I owned, I've sold, but I, I kept in touch with a, a company that has an asset in French Guiana. And French Guiana, you know, their partner was a Russian company. And this Russian company, after the war in Ukraine, uh, they were sanctioned. Uh, but uh, but all these guys wanted to do was pay them to get their side of the asset and get them out of the deal, mm -hmm. and they wanted to depart. But the problem was that they couldn't give them money. Mm -hmm. And so that project just died on the vine. Yeah. Um, and now what we're uh, seeing is that projects where, like, copper that may be produced in Ecuador with Solaris on their project where they had a potential investment by Zijin, even though that copper is not coming to Canada... You know, uh, they're TSX listed, but, you know, they basically stopped that. And that yep. would have been very good for the company. I think SRG Graphite. I'm not sure if you follow that no, story at all. Like, they're re-domiciling. They're moving to Saudi Arabia because they can't get investment. Yeah. As, yeah. as well. Like, like, guys, we got to leave. Like, yeah, so, so what's the advantage of Canada? Like, we do have endowment, but we're infrastructurally challenged. Yeah. Uh, but we have access to capital. But that might go away or be reduced with the, with the capital gains. Uh, we know we have a, a stable 
mineral tenure policy, you know, but maybe in BC we don't. I mean, I didn't even know this, but, uh, you know, and they don't talk about this much in the Yukon tour, but the southeastern part of the Yukon has been in a staking moratorium for 10 years. Oh, it's been renewed. Exactly. Yeah. It's been renewed every year. Yeah, I mean, people who have got staked ground, that's not a problem. But if you want to stake new ground, you can't. Wasn't aware of that. Yeah. My fear is that that might translate into some places in B.C., where some people have a moratorium and they just continually update or renew it every year. Like, Would you currently invest in Canada? I know you don't invest in Greenstone Belt anyway, but the rest of Canada? Uh, I'm, I'm in Quebec. Um, and uh, just looking, uh, I mean, maybe prospect generators. Some of them have projects in Minnesota, uh, I'm sorry, in, in BC. I do have Yukon yeah. uh, with respect to that copper one that's close to Whitehorse. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I'm not over... Overly enthusiastic. Yeah, it's like no. I'm, I'm, I'm not sensing it. <laughs> no, but I've always had problems with, with British Columbia, the, the uh, Golden Triangle, because, I mean, a lot of the deposits besides Pretium and Red Chris were uh, low-grade and infrastructurally challenged. It's a BC porphyry problem yeah, in general. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, so I, you know, when I look at copper production, I've been in Brazil... Uh, when I look at development projects, I'm in the states in on, on private ground, um, in exploration in like in Peru, um, so I, I, I'm in different place or or in Australia, uh, but I'm, yeah, I'm not over the moon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I can sense that. <laughs> no, fantastic. Um, another big topic I want to talk with you about is AI because that's also part of the presentation you've given. I think it's extremely interesting. It's developing. It's at the forefront of everything. And uh, who did I have here? Oh, Joe Littman was sitting in your chair yeah. the other day, and he said, well, every company needs to become an AI company. Even Newmont needs to do implement more AI and even include the name in the, uh, AI in the name or something. Like, just be, m- use it more. Yeah. Right? Like, wh- wh- what are your thoughts on AI? Like, let's start there, and then we'll get a bit more granular on the topic. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is that it will be something that goes through everything, and it'll be a tool, and the tool will be used for different things. It'll be used for optimizing, let's say, a... Uh, you know, uh, operational efficiencies. Like in, in Newmont, we used to have this uh, optimizer to know where everything went. Okay, this oxide goes to this heap leach pad, this refractory ore goes to this roaster, or this refractory ore goes to that autoclave, and there was an optimization sort of idea there. And, and you know, uh, with AI, with all the data, they probably can do that even better, but obviously it's not Newmont anymore, it's Barrick. But, um, you know, th- so every... S- uh, every soup to nuts aspect of mining, there might be an application for the tool, and and I call it a tool. Um, but in some places, uh, it, it may be hard, uh, and and just to apply it to apply it is not the way to go about it. You've got to see what, what, what you know. Where is the efficiency here? And and the one I'm um, looking at and, and incorporating in the letter is a quick way of generating a, you know, a probabilistic mineral resource estimate off of drill results that are publicly available. And the big data behind it is like millions of intersections from the S&P Global Database that generated 4,000 plus resource estimates in gold. And then the machine has learned what it takes from drilling intersections to get what kind of resource. Did you build that model? You built that bot? No, this model was built by uh, a, guy, a guy named Aaron McMahon uh, uh, from Tacit Vision. He's got his own firm, and he used to do 10 years of private equity work. I was introduced to him in January during the AME conference, and I've been checking the results and modeling a bunch of things that I know, and that's probably the human intelligence part to know what looks right and what looks wrong from the site visits and knowing continuity of mineralization and knowing that, okay, th- this is a P90 grade, but I, I got confidence in it, or this is a P10 grade and that's probably too high. Uh, so that's what we're trying to incorporate in this, the, the human part with the, okay. uh, uh, with the machine learning part. When do you think AI, starting to use AI makes sense? Like how early... Would, would you start implementing it? When, when does it start to make well, sense? Well, you can use it with grassroots because th- that's big data. Um, and so the whole idea with grassroots is, is you get big regional geophysical surveys that have mag, that have gravity, that have um, uh, remote sensing, maybe LIDAR. And then over that, you would look at a, an, anag- an analogous terrain or a deposit in that terrain and say, 
what are the aspects of this deposit and now go look for another one of these. What you need is consistency of data. The, all that mag survey has to go over every kilometer square of that area. You cannot have differences in data. The problem is some people are applying this on exploration projects where all the data is, let's say, here, and then saying, find me something here. But the artificial intelligence is looking and, and would say, well, this is a good spot. Well, why is it a good spot? Because all the data tells us it is. Well, we know that. <laughs> what about that spot? Well, there's no data. Yeah. So it's hard for it to extrapolate beyond the constraints of the data. So big regional surveys work, and then when you get into the prospect scale, then you do another level of data and apply a new AI tool. Where, where do you have the best data? Like, where do you get the data from? Like, if you're a grassroots explorer, you don't have usually a lot of cash or a lot of data. I'm, I'm unless glad you, you go asked to this. Unless you go to government agencies I'm glad or you asked this, because for all the, you know, the Canadian government is looked at as a low-risk jurisdiction, and then you have access to capital, one of the best jurisdictions uh, for me is Australia in that they don't give you flow-through financing, but they give you free data. Yeah. So the level, uh, the, they level the playing field for exploration companies with big companies who would only be, have the capital to do that that kind of survey and so all that data is public like you can get apps about geology that you can put on your phone and know exactly where you are um, and they actually give you grants for drilling new holes in new areas so if you spend X they'll give you back like a hundred grand or 200 grand which every dollar helps yeah. so all that is is great incentive it's not like hey you can get flow through shares, so you could spend it on your GNA and drill 5,000 year, uh, you know, whole uh, meters and do this again for another 20 years. That's like if you drill that hole, we'll give you the money back. But if you don't drill the hole, you get no money. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think in terms of databases and all that, um, Australia is probably one of the best places. And when I talk to people outside of Australia, like in Argentina, I'm, I'm sort of helping the government there with the programs they're putting together to bring more foreign direct investment there for mining. I'm saying, well, you should look at these people. Look, well, they're actually doing the surveys and they just give it to people. You it's know, massive incentive. It's Absolutely. massive incentive, yeah. The barrier of entry is very low. Well, the other thing is what they're doing, and innovation doesn't all have to be high tech, but I mean, what they're doing is a preemptive social license to operate. So they basically build polygons of areas that they've already done the social license to operate. So when you show up, you don't need 20 people in your community relations group, and you don't need to wait two years to uh, get that social license That's to Argentina operate. Argentina or Australia? This is Argentina. Argentina. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, but that kind of innovative way of doing social license to operate should be more readily looked at by other jurisdictions, no. even jurisdictions that seem to think they have it solved. Mentally, I'm jumping around a little bit. I'm, yeah. I'm on Argentina and jurisdictions right now. It's like, is, is Argentina the jurisdiction to be right now? It seems like it's changing a lot. It's it's changing positive, like, but you got to remember that the good provinces are good provinces. And the bad provinces are still bad provinces. There's a good rule. Uh, any, every province that starts with an S is a good province. Is that well, still I would apply? say San Juan. Uh, I don't think. Like uh, San Juan, Salta. I don't think Santa Cruz is as great as people think it is, because uh, mm. it's. You know, I still think it's very corrupt, and now they're going to be lifting their royalties there to five percent from three. Yeah. Uh, I think for me, Salta, Jujuy, San Juan are the places to be. Huh. Everything else could be problematic. But what's changed, too, is that the federal government has changed. The federal government has no authority with respect to permitting mining in any province. The province has the jurisdiction. But the province, I mean, the, the federal government could screw up the ability to do foreign direct investment in projects. Now they have eliminated that by, one, lowering the tax rate, importantly, eliminating after two years the duties and tariffs on the commodities you export, and then importantly for people that are looking for financing and debt financing, um, uh, they have uh, allowed, you know, uh, put back the ability to repatriate your funds. So you, with that repatriation, debt uh, can be administered to these, uh, so these uh, development projects. Yeah, Rob McEwen was speaking very highly of Argentina because he had a meeting with Javier Millet as yeah, well. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No, no he, he's uh, trying. He's doing his best to... To, to well, I mean, this is more than trying. Like, I was down in Mendoza when that law was actually mm -hmm. passed. And, it's, and, and, you know, then I went to go see Abra Silver up in Salta. And, and that has potentially significant implications on their bottom line. Yeah. 
No, fantastic. Um, I know we jumped around a little bit. I just want to come back to AI real quick. Did we cover the whole topic? Like, I'm curious, any other developments AI that we should be yeah, looking at I mean, and paying the, attention to? Yeah, I mean, the problem to? that it could be with AI is the data gaps. No. Uh, and another problem is that it doesn't always work. And one company specifically saying that they found a deposit through AI in Central Africa, it, it was not an AI discovery. It was well known. They paid $150 million for it. It still got a water problem, and a lot of companies had looked at it previously. That wasn't the cobalt thing, was it? Was that cobalt? Oh, okay. I'm just, okay. Yeah, that's cobalt. But that was that K Bill Gates, -O -O Amazon thing, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah, yeah okay. And, but that's basically AI-driven not only by technology, but that's not how they found this thing. It was known. <laughs> but that's what's driving their funding. Well, so it's, it's nice really, you put a nice marketing brand. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So because it's coming from Silicon Valley, if it didn't say AI, they wouldn't invest in it. Do you have a couple examples of AI success in, in exploration? Like where uh, AI potentially helped, assisted, supported, or even made the discovery? Made the discovery? I no. know that's probably a stretch, but like, or uh, no. successfully assisted? No, not that I know of. Okay, that, not that, that is I interesting. No, that is I very mean, interesting. but we're, we're early stages in the implementation. Uh, uh, the thing is, it's... Uh, uh, because obviously cobalt has improved it, wow. and they're probably the ones that were pushing it the most. Mm. Uh, and I d haven't seen anything from them that suggests that they found anything through AI. I think gold spot discoveries, and I don't want to, you know, um, I think supported Imperial Metals drilling a massive intercept at, at some point. I'm not sure if it was a couple of years ago. Yeah, I have no idea. Okay. I like, no it idea didn't that. make that many headlines, but apparently that was an AI, like, found hole, but okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, one other topic I want to discuss with you, Joe, and we've had that discussion, I think, two years ago, is revaluation of reserves, especially for the major mining companies. Background for the question is maybe we've been hearing a lot of pressure, or not pressure, but like calls for M&A in the space because, you know, majors are depleting their reserves, they need to replenish. But if they were to recalculate their um, reserves a little bit, because Newman is sitting at 1450, Barrick at 1350, even just take it up by a couple hundred bucks. Like, what would that change for the reserve base of those major mining companies? And would that alleviate some of that M&A pressure? And so I was under the impression that would happen as well. So when they went from 12, 1250 to 1450 uh, or 1400, 1450, uh, what it looked like on the sensitivity chart for Newmont was that they could add like 10 to, I think it was 10 or 12 million ounces if they changed the price. $200 an ounce or $250 an ounce. And then when you looked at the numbers when they actually did it, they didn't add anything <laughs> because the only incremental addition was their um, acquisition of 100% of Yanacocha. That's what added the reserves. And uh, I do a capital markets um, short course uh, uh, with, with several colleagues. And there was a few Newmont attendees at that. And during that conference, they came up to me and they basically said a, a lot of the reason why they weren't able to show a big increase with the cost increase was basically prices. The cost of everything had gone up so significantly uh, around COVID um, that, you know, uh, it, it, it didn't generate the kind of expansion. I, I explain that to me. Like, cause I'm going to ask you for a feasibility study from Newmont and uh, yeah. cost that out. Like, I'm just asking for an increase in reserves to show me that. Yeah, but the right? problem is the costs, so are, telling you, the costs yeah. are telling you that that's no longer economic. Got, okay. Yeah. Because it's so low grade, uh, yeah. even if we increase so prices. If, if we that's what talking, I mean, like clarify that just yeah, a little so, bit. Yeah, so if you're talking about like margin, if you're looking at operating margin, you say, wow, the gold price went up, you should be making so much money. But a, the gold price went up 5%, my cost went up 10%. Okay. So that's margin compression. And yeah. then there's sort of like a, a, a part of that went to the reserves. So okay. their sensitivity was on keeping costs flat. Gotcha. The cost didn't stay okay. flat. So, but if you were to do the same calculation today, they would have. They probably would show. A that's sense what that, I mean. Like, but the, the problem is, we can't depend on it. No, like, no. It's, it's more. It's an interesting, like mental exercise. Because. But you have to look at that. Absolutely, you're right, Kai. When you're looking at acquiring, and this is one thing I pushed when I was with strategic planning at Newmont and corporate development, is that we had to internally measure what we were buying. So if there was a better project internally that we didn't have to buy, should we build that one? versus this other one that we have to pay for. Exactly. Yeah. But what's what's sexy <laughs> is the acquisition. Of course. It yeah. generates bonuses and everything else. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So, uh, yeah. And so that, that was an internal thing that we did uh, because there was never a model for some of these companies. And uh, uh, the, the team at Newmont that I work with, we generated a model for Newmont. Yeah. Okay. So, so the last topic. Like, if I were to come to you with a presentation... Right? Like, I'm the new CEO of a mining company. I haven't told you anything about it yet. 
what would you need to see in that presentation that would get you excited? Yeah. And I'm leaving that really empty. It can be commodity, it can be team. I'm, I don't want to put anything in your words. Like, but what would get you excited right now if you were to look at a new story? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering first, how did you find me? <laughs> uh, you know, did you call me? Did you I text me? I paid 500 me? bucks to come in here <laughs> and chase you down. <laughs> that would be one thing, because usually the approach I have is to be <laughs> proactive. So I find yeah. the company I want to talk to. I, I do get approached, but I usually don't. Or like, let's assume you scour the internet and you find a new story. What would it be that excites you right now? What would excite me is, is somebody with a deposit or a potential analog that looks significant. And what are they doing to explore for it? And what is their background? So, I mean, I'll give you an example. I didn't invest in this, but I like the story was B Metals. Mm -hmm. So I like Zambia. I like the potential in Zambia. I like the fact that they're building infrastructure there. I like the fact that the, the government's very pro uh, mining there. Uh, and, and, you know, now they're building infrastructure with respect to the rail to the DRC, and another spur would take the concentrate out west as well uh, for, from that part of Zambia. And, and J uh, John Wilton, the CEO, is very knowledgeable in the Central African Copper Belt. And him there gives me a lot of um, you know, confidence that he knows what he's doing. And, and so when he came to me, um, uh, you know, talking about B metals, they were mostly about Japan. And then when they were mostly about Japan, I remember talking to them. And I said, well, you know, I'm interested in the Zambia stuff. <laughs> well, we're not doing anything on that. But, you know, okay, when you do something, let Give me, me know. And then now they're not talking about Japan anymore. You know, the weight of their valuation, the weight of the, what they raised the last financing on was all for Zambia. You know, and, and I think it should have always been all about Zambia because of the copper, um, you know, and because of the potential. So you're most excited about copper? Is that, Am I taking that? Uh, yeah, that I right am conclusion? excited about copper. I, I, and, you know, I, because, you know, with, with some of these critical minerals, the big thing is, is more complicated. It's not just the resource. It's about the processing. Mm -hmm. And that takes more detail. And you've got to really understand if they know what they're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and it's not uh, the mining part and all that stuff really doesn't matter as much. I mean, because, you know, most of the stuff, you know, with ionic clays, free digging, yeah. uh, it's really about do you understand the metallurgy and what product do you produce? Yeah. Like gold is easier. It's fungible. Uh, but I think people trying to find copper in jurisdictions that they can permit, that they can develop with some infrastructure, it's very hard. What jurisdiction are we going to see the next uh, big discovery in? I mean... Um, I think more people will go to Argentina and, and this will drive people that not only are in Argentina now and are basically staying in Argentina, you know, are committed to Argentina, uh, but now I think we might see new entrants. So I think Argentina will pick up and I think definitely Peru is picking up. So I've got this conference. I'll go to Peru and see a new a couple more projects in Peru in November. And I think, um, you know, they're pulling the finger out and they're getting going. Yeah, political change, I think, is key in, in Peru well, as well. It, it, it's very it's, left with it's the, the Castillo, impetus, I think. Yeah, but it's the impetus to know that they've fallen to third in okay. terms of Oh, okay, so it is a regional media. competition there, They're, right? I mean, a bit, uh, you know, with the Congo, yeah. and they want to get back up. Okay. You know, and so they're pushing development, they're pushing production, and they're pushing exploration. They're trying to move those permits forward and get back up to second. Fantastic. Joe, what a wonderful conversation. All I could right. chat with you for hours. It's always great All to right. catch up with you. Thank you so much for your time. Where can we find more of your work? Uh, explorationinsights.com. And, uh, yeah, thanks very much. And, uh, you know. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. And uh, we'll catch up very soon again. All we'll right. Have, we'll have to do that more regularly. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in here at SOAR Financially from the Rule Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. Really appreciate you watching. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Of course, more of a deep dive into exploration topics, but really informational. So we talked a lot micro today. Uh, for us, for our channel. We didn't talk a lot of macro. We'll save that for next time. Yeah, I have no idea about macro. Uh, see, we got enough other guests talking <laughs> about that as well. No, no, appreciate you tuning in. If you like the conversation, leave a comment, leave a like, and of course, subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll be back with lots more. Thank you.